Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 874. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelegi. And this is Wednesday, August 7th, 2024. All right, we welcome you to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. If you have time, please subscribe, like, and comment. Go to the comment section because this is where we get to hear what you're thinking. I am with David in Jerusalem. Uh, we have a little controversy because sometimes I oddly pronounce his last name incorrectly. And that's a family trait. That's a Coulson family trait. I can barely pronounce Coulson correctly. It's Pelegi, right? Pelegi, or Pelegi, or Pelegi. Or Pelegi, Pelegi yes. yes. Um, and we've had you on the program uh, probably a half dozen times in the last uh, nine or ten years talking about issues uh, that are important to the Middle East and especially Israel and Jerusalem. I've taken uh, a couple tours led by you uh, throughout the, the countryside there. And I, I'll be honest, Israel and the Middle East is one of my favorite places. Uh, the land and the people are, are lovely, and uh, the history is just uh, emoting from the region. Um, mm -hmm. And so when we have to talk about hard topics like war, um, I don't enjoy doing it. Uh, well, I, I love talking about uh, religious topics and uh, the Episcopal Church and, uh, you know, those type of things. But this is a religious topic on a different scale. Um, this is a religious topic where life and death and war uh, are almost certain at this time. And, you know, that's why I have you on the program to talk about these people. Why do you have David on so often? Well, you know, it's getting more difficult for you over there. And I want to talk a little bit, you know, a range of issues, uh, certainly. But, uh, you know, we woke up in the last couple of days with Iran certain to attack at this point. Uh, tell me mm -hmm. the the feeling now where you you are in that. Well, there is the you might say the the, the buzz on the street or the the word from uh, from folks who who know or may not know. Uh, we're expecting a, a fairly severe attack from Hezbollah, and the latest seems to be that uh, Iran will support that attack but will be less involved than uh, first expected. So an attack from Iran, maybe attack from the uh, Shiite volunteers in, the, in, in Syria, uh, an attack from the Houthis, maybe a, an uptick of uh, terrorist activity from the West Bank. All, all of this is uh, what's being expected. People, on one hand, there's a certain sense of anxiety but uh, on the other hand, folks are somewhat jaded uh, and uh, exhausted. And you, you sometimes come to a point that exhaustion leads to uh, a certain amount of fatalism or pessimism. And so I would say that uh, that uh, is probably the prevailing mood. Um, people and some cities have been told not to travel unnecessarily away from home to be close to your bomb shelter those are cities uh in the north and these by the way might be jewish cities or arab cities uh and here in jerusalem we're not sure what to expect on one hand uh, where we are at christ church we're just a few hundred meters from the uh, dome of the rock the haram of sharif so we can't imagine uh any Islamic group wanting to take the chance and uh, hurt uh, Muslim shrines. And on the other hand, uh, not far from us would be the government uh, the complex, the parliament, uh, different government ministries. And so there are some reports to say that those will be attacked. Uh, but again, uh, for those of us living in Jerusalem, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uncertain as well. I had a Jewish neighbor uh, 10 years ago, uh, and she was uh, from Tel Aviv, and she would express that there was always an undercurrent of anxiety living in Israel. Um, you know, 
to, to her, which it's a matter of life. This is so much more than what she's talking about. This is just you're waking up, you're going to sleep, and you're prepared at any time to go to a shelter. Uh, y yes, there is this uh, nagging uh, Jewish anxiety that uh, they're all out to kill us. And in many ways, uh, with, with the rise of the state of Israel, and Israel having its own army and Air Force, uh, a lot of the younger generation say to uh, their parents or grandparents, you know, you're exaggerating. We're all, we're safe now. We, we can protect ourselves. And then came October the 7th and October the 7th um, shocked so many people and it actually forced uh, people to, um, you might say it just pushed back uh, or better yet and strengthened this anxiety. You know, they're all out to kill us. They're all out. Uh, they're all out to get us. Now that may, of course, not be true. But at the same time, that uh, is the effect of many hundreds of years of trauma. Mm -hmm. And that uh, trauma turns uh, everything uh, into a threat. Um, and many people will say, you see, this kind of anti-Semitism uh, hasn't gone away on October the 7th, proves that. And uh, therefore, we as Jews are vulnerable uh, virtually everywhere we go. Okay. Uh in the history of war, especially the last you know, two, three, four centuries, um, the worst enemy of a war is time, and especially a victory war. October 7th is just a little more than 300 days ago, uh, mm -hmm. in which you've been in, a, in an active conflict uh, trying to rid Hamas from the Gaza Strip. Uh, mm -hmm. What has time done to this war? Well, you, you ask a, a, a very interesting and even somewhat controversial uh, co controversial question. Uh, on one hand, uh, over nine months, uh, you, the, the back of Hamas has been broken. Uh, most of its commanders have been, uh, the significant commanders uh, have been either captured or killed. Uh, the army performed better than uh, certainly than most people expected. But the question that's raging, raging here in Israel uh, surrounds the prime minister and he promised that there would be total victory. And the issue is, can there be, uh, can there be total victory? Especially in the light of the fact that uh, the prime minister does not want to set out any plan uh, for Gaza, you know, after the war comes to an end. So if you leave a vacuum, for example, and Hamas comes back, is that uh, total victory? Um, if you bring the Palestinian Authority from the West Bank back to rule Gaza, you know, what are those consequences? So uh, Israel's in a very, uh, on one hand, it's in a very good position tactically, but strategically uh, in its relationship with the Gaza Strip, uh, it is uh, very uncertain. And this, I think, drives, uh, certainly drives some, some of the anxiety. Maybe militarily Hamas will be finished, but at the same time, politically, religiously, it still might remain a force within the Strip, and it might be able to at least regain some power and some influence. So, uh, taken together with the issue of the hostages, it's created uh, a lot of uh, controversy and uh, a lot of anger in Israel. Uh, I was reading the Times of Israel uh, website newspaper the other day, and uh, you have protesters blocking. Very good one to read, by the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People are blocking traffic like they would here in America in protest demanding that mm -hmm. you uh, negotiate for the hostages. That's right. So here's the controversy and here is the dilemma. Most of the public wants to prosecute the war and they want to really, quote unquote, finish with Hamas. All right. But at the same time, the same percentage of the public, they want Israel to do everything possible to get those 
hostages back. Well, these two um, goals are, uh, they're not very easy to, uh, to harmonize. And it's not so much a left-right thing. Uh, it is, uh, the, the, the split is certainly uh, deeper than that. And what those uh, protesters uh, argue, and they have, again, they have a lot of sympathy, even amongst conservatives, is that the state of Israel has a contract with its citizens. And because the state of Israel failed on October the 7th uh, in uh, protecting the communities around the uh, Gaza Strip, it has a moral obligation to do everything possible uh, to release those who are still alive. This is, again, it is very, uh, very uh, difficult. Uh, if you think of it morally, ethically, you think of it practically, strategically, think about the future. What if we don't? What happens if we don't try to get these hostages back? What will it do to national morale? What if we um, pursue the war or, sorry, don't pursue the war and Hamas comes back and they uh, do to us again what they did on October the 7th. So Israel faces some incredible uh, political, and I would say ethical, even moral dilemmas that uh, I certainly wouldn't wish on uh, on any nation. You talked about the vacuum. Um, we have great examples uh, in the history of war of uh, voids being filled by absolute evil. Uh, Russia went into Afghanistan, uh, mm -hmm. found themselves in a stalemate, got out. America thought they could do it better. Went into Afghanistan and uh, recently have pulled out and the vacuum uh, is the Taliban. The vacuum is you know, something worse that was there. Uh, is that a fear that uh, uh, the leadership there has for the Gaza Strip? It, it, it certainly yes. If you if you finish the war too early, that's a possibility. But then, if you prosecute the war and you achieve what's called "quote unquote" total victory, uh, how are you going to, especially if you're Israel, um, uh, what's the right word? And, and after 1945, it's called denazification, right? How how are you going to? destroy the influence of Hamas uh, and replace it with something. What happens if Hamas um, survives and then declares, uh, then declares victory? Um, what do people take that seriously, uh, uh, especially in the Islamic world? Or can people see through that Sinwar brought disaster uh, upon his people? So again, when and how do you, uh, do, you, do you stop this war? When, when should it stop? Uh, it, is, uh, it is very, very difficult. Um, and I, I think the lesson of the war, uh, or, uh, when you ask me, is that, or, or the original sin of all this, is, is that... Um, Israel, um, for years and years and years, thought it could ignore the Palestinian issue. And instead of seeking reconciliation with the Palestinians or trying to work out some kind of better arrangement, um, it simply thought the problem would go away. And by the way, if, you, if I'm sounding critical of Israel, it does sound critical of, uh, of the Palestinian Authority and, uh, and uh, other Palestinian circles who also thought we really should, don't have to compromise. Uh, eventually, we'll be able to force Israel through international pressure to give us what we want. So both sides uh, find compromise found, still find compromise really hard, and therefore they're sort of trying to let the facts on the ground right overwhelm, overwhelm uh, the other side. When I say that Israel should negotiate with the Palestinian people, I don't have any plan or solution that's ideal, right? But the process of trying to negotiate or trying to work towards some kind of reconciliation, uh, even if it doesn't last 100 years, 
is much better than the, the current state in which we find ourselves. The state of October 6, 2023 was different. You were in a kind of a, a quasi peace with places like and, and countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt and others. And there was uh, talks of further reconciliation and peace with other countries that you've been at war at for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's changed now. That's it's not gone. There are still you still have support, but are you gonna? Is that something that can be it's, lost? No, no. Uh, it's it's on hold, and as long as Iran remains a threat, um, and then countries like the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia uh, will uh, continue to, will ultimately uh, start to make positive moves. Uh, uh, towards uh, Israel uh, once again. So uh, there's something uh, that probably will uh, be uh, restarted in, in the near future or, or, or maybe a bit, a bit after this uh, war uh, is over or at least this war comes to, uh, you might say, a some kind of uh, temporary truce. Uh, the Saudis and all the other Sunni states are uh, very fearful of uh, Iran's growing uh, Shiite influence in the area, and that uh, they um, are going to cozy up to Israel as much as possible. Israel has uh, 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 technology. Israel has uh, a military, of course, could take on Iran, although it's not something we should do. Uh, but uh, is Israel's a counterbalance, right, uh, to Iranian, you might say, messianic, uh, messianic intentions, uh, Iranian eschatology, uh, which sees itself as not only defeating Israel, but uh, working to bring the Islamic end of days. Okay, you brought it up. Uh, I was a young uh, a Christian in the early 1980s and had at my my uh, bookshelf the late great planet Earth and other end times books that were just great sci-fi for me, uh, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I remember my history teacher in high school uh, describing world events and describing how World War Three would start. And mm -hmm. he was quite certain it would start in the Middle East. But this mm -hmm. is back when there was a Soviet empire. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just uh, what we have now. And he said, no matter what, you know, World War III will start through the Middle East. And I had, he was not a Christian and into the end times prophecy stuff. But there's, there's an element of truth to World War III would start there. But you and I, as Christian men, uh, do we contemplate the messianic uh, roles in this? Do we think of the end times of this? Is, is this something that we, we want to contemplate? Or, And I say this because you took me to uh, Armageddon when I visited uh, Israel. So uh, let's, let's sit back and, and talk as Christian men in this. Okay, so first of all, when I took you to Armageddon, I, I hope you do remember that I, told, I uh, strongly suggested <laughs> that Megiddo... Uh, in northern Israel, Tel Megiddo, uh, it is not Armageddon, uh, as we read about in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 16. Uh, and there are many reasons, right, uh, not only uh, linguistically, but also to do with geography and, right, uh, Jewish uh, eschatological uh, understandings, you know, of the Second Temple period. Right. There's no redemption or big battle that ever happens in the north, right? The, the battle at the end of time, which is whether it's spiritual or actually physical, always takes place in Jerusalem and always takes place uh, in and around the Temple Mount. Um, the Bible talks about Armageddon as being a mountain, and of course there's no mountain at Armageddon, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, I say that, uh, or I emphasize that, because in many cases, the uh, eschatological scenarios that uh, people have somehow uh, 
painted for themselves or the ones the creative understandings or creative understandings of how the Lord comes back and what happens before uh, his coming. Uh, it, it is very, it's, it's very amazing. But at the same time, it is not a, um, uh, you might say it's, I don't think it can be supported, uh, supported biblically. And I think what, what's important in all this uh, is the uh, under, what we, understanding is that we really need to be careful with our eschatology. So let me say, Kevin, that I, I, hope, I hope everyone will understand I'm an Orthodox Christian. I can affirm that Jesus will return to judge uh, the, the living and the dead. But at the same time, uh, people come up with these eschatological schemes or these ways of understanding how these end time events will unfold. And uh, oftentimes uh, there's something very, very dangerous uh, about them. So, for example, premillennialism. Um, oftentimes leads to passivity. Yes, mm -hmm. there's yes, it is. the Lord's coming again. He's coming soon. We know things are going to become wicked. We know people are going to fall away. We know, that, you know, there will be an increase uh, in um, uh, evil. So there's nothing we can do except for maybe we can uh, remain in Christ. We'll be saved. Our families will be saved. And that's it. Uh, and, and there's something very dangerous about that kind of passivity. And on the other hand, you have what we've known, what we've called in Christian history, some kind of uh, dis, not dispensationalism, post-millennialism. And uh, this is the idea that we can speed up the end or slow it down by what we do or don't do, right? We can hasten his coming. And uh, there are Jews, Christians, and Muslims uh, throughout history who've had this understanding in one form or another, uh, and it leads to a messianic presumption. And uh, this is what we're suffering from uh, today. We have uh, Sinwar, we have Hezbollah, we have Iran uh, that believe they're coming into uh, the Islamic last days or or you know the final stage of history as they understand it from an Islamic perspective, and they need to eliminate Israel, uh, and they need to spread Sharia, and their uh, messianic age will come the minute they um, or the the world is under Sharia law. Right? All the nations of the world will have to be ruled by Sharia. Doesn't mean that everyone has to be a Muslim. It just means that uh, the influence of Sharia or the reality of Sharia has to be the law, has to be the law of every land. And of course, they're going to uh, work uh, to to make this possible. Um, we have uh, this Jews as well, who think by either settling the West Bank or by um, rebuilding the temple as some might want to do, that somehow this will spread and this, sorry, this will hasten the coming, uh, hasten the coming of the Messiah. And uh, Christians have our own version of this, but I think every, every time in history that we've tried to hasten the coming of the Messiah, um, with, uh, there are a few exceptions, uh, especially in Anglican history, but every time we've tried to do this, it has led to one disaster after another. And I think it ends up being very, very dangerous. Um, and just let me give you an example, you know, from Jewish history. When the Jews revolted against Rome in the year 66, they revolted with, an, you might say, an eschatology that uh, understood that if we just start this war against Rome, God will see our intention and he will come to our rescue, and the end times, the, the redemption, will be, will, will, will be hastened. And there was a second Jewish revolt in the year, we don't know about it, but in the year 118, 119, uh, this was a revolt 
against Rome in the diaspora in places like Libya, Egypt, Cyprus. And it seems to have been based on the same eschatology. And then there was a big, another big Jewish revolt in the land of Judea in the year 132 to 135. That's the, the revolt of Shimon Bar Kokhva. And that revolt led to the worst disaster in Jewish history, perhaps with the exception of the Holocaust. Now, after three strikes, we say, you're out. And the, the rabbis and the, uh, you might say, or, or the, the, the teachers of scripture uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the people of Israel said, you know what, this interpretation of how we get to the end days is not serving us very well. What we need to do is to wait patiently for the Messianic age to come. And uh, when the Messiah comes, uh, we'll recognize it. Our suffering will be over. And of course, this led to uh, what the critics called Jewish passivity. We'll just wait, we'll suffer. And this was the prevailing, you might say, Jewish eschatology until 1967. And then there was a, a movement or a group of Jews who said, well, oh, wait a minute, we hear the footsteps of the Messiah, okay? We need to hasten, you know, the, the Messianic age or hasten, you know, the, 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 the coming. And unless this is done very carefully, um, it, uh, it always leads to some kind of disaster or bloodshed uh, or... Um, you know, usually a great, somehow a great loss, a great loss of life. What's the exception? Well, there are exceptions. For example, that in the 19th, early 19th century, we had Anglicans who decided, uh, or they had the same sort of eschatology, that uh, you could hasten the coming of Jesus. Now, whether we agree with that or not is one thing, but at the same time, they thought that by spreading the gospel, or freeing the slaves, or by uh, bringing social reform to, to, to Britain, that this would indeed right, hasten, the, uh, hasten the coming of the Lord. All of those things that they did uh, led to, you might say, a betterment or an improvement in society, a growth of the church, or bringing people into a deeper you know, relationship uh, with the Lord. So if we want to hasten, as Peter says, the Lord's coming, then we will, yes, recommit ourselves to the gospel or recommit ourselves to uh, the teaching of Jesus or sharing the teaching of Jesus or can maybe confronting evil in our society. We just have to be very careful about any, any messianic scheme. And by the way, there are secular ones as well, like communism fascism, right, that's going to promise us, you know, uh, some kind of redemption that is uh, outside the bounds of Scripture, okay? Well, I know it's a, it's a lot, but this kind of growing, you might say, frustration amongst Jews and Muslims and in some places even Christians mm -hmm. in this desire, you know, for a shortcut, you know, to bring us to the end of days, I think it's something we should all be a bit watchful uh, for, and it's something that the church needs to um, make sure that in our teaching and preaching, uh, we, we are not uh, letting people take this shortcut. All right. You're a priest of an Anglican church in Jerusalem, and uh, it is presumably full of Christians, and you minister to Christians in this time of anxiety and war. Uh, how does that work? How do you, you talk to your Christian congregation uh, in this time of anxiety? Uh, and many, I, I assume, have served in this recent war. Um, how does that work? Well, uh, I think it. Um, there's some really uh, good advice for us, uh, Kevin. Uh, and uh, this advice is very, very helpful for um, folks living in uh, uh, normal times, but also in, you know, very desperate times. And uh, I would say 
quote unquote apocalyptic times. Not that I'm necessarily suggesting that this is the end of the world, but uh, you know, the events are so overwhelming and they're so big uh, that when things like wars and um, hostages and you might say all this hatred, for example, towards Jews, when, but when all this comes upon uh, someone, you, again, you feel helpless and you feel like, well, there's nothing I can do about this. And very easy to say, I give up, I surrender, or it's hopeless. But uh, if you remember uh, Peter's advice to the earliest church uh, in the book of Acts, um, I think that that's the best advice, that uh, the best pattern that we could follow. That we meet together regularly, uh, that we pray together, that we break bread, that we uh, listen to the teaching uh, uh, from the scriptures. And of course, we make sure that the community knows that uh, we, uh, we are there to, to help uh, those who are believers, whether they're Arab believers, Jewish believers, or, or folks who uh, might somehow be uh, from uh, overseas or people who come from Europe or, or the United States, uh, people know that uh, I think our community is certain that, our, that uh, uh, we are certainly there for them spiritually uh, and otherwise. Uh, but we just continue by, by um, you know, focusing on the scripture, coming to the, coming to the, uh, coming to the Lord's table and uh, by praying, uh, interceding uh, together and uh, in our intercession, it's, it's, it's a time of lament, but it's also trying to, to listen to the Lord's voice and have the Lord direct us, right, um, how we should pray, how we should pray for Israel, how we should pray for, uh, pray for the Palestinians. And um, I think this is also something that's, uh, something that's, uh, that's quite important. So the congregation is is in fairly fairly good heart i would say that uh, people are a bit exhausted uh emotionally uh, physically we we had many of our many from our uh, fellowship and uh, children of staff or even staff members themselves that uh, were called up to serve in the military and uh, as i told you earlier all returned safely although one jewish believer um and our circle lost both of his legs. Um, it's a very strong faith and he, he has bounced back uh, from his injuries with a, a great zest for life and his, his faith is, uh, is, still, is still intact. Um, at the same time, with many Palestinians who uh, work for us, worship with us, um, they're also having difficult times and uh, we have an extensive work uh, with, uh, um, especially amongst the poor, uh, and the church has been able to uh, assist uh, those members and those outside of our community. Um, so it, it's been a huge, huge challenge. Um, and again, the challenge is for us not to give up hope uh, and to know that you know, we continue to pray God will turn what human rebellion and demonic mischief you know, meant for evil, uh, God will turn it to good. Um, and that's what, that's what we're praying and hoping for at the end of all this, yes, that God will use this redemptively, yes, for the nations and the peoples, all the peoples of the Middle East. There has to be an end. I mean, all war at some point has to end. And up until now, all wars have, but we never send men to war. Uh, we always send our boys, but uh, boys never come back from war. It's always men have to come back from war. It's an experience mm -hmm. to be on the front lines uh, fighting an enemy. Uh, how do you minister to the soldiers who come back to your church? We, um, we, we've taken uh, the advice and the help of, uh, of uh, professionals um, who have uh, come over and to, uh, who have helped us 
uh, with uh, uh, issues of trauma. And so we haven't tried to take on, uh, take, take this on uh, ourselves, but uh, a number of Christian ministries uh, over the, the last nine months have sent over trauma counselors. Some of them have been excellent, and very, very helpful. And they've just laid out ways that you help, uh, you know, uh, people uh, help people coming back. Um, and the way that you help those who are living in a, you might say, uh, a high, higher state of, uh, of anxiety uh, uh, than most. So it's these these professionals have been Christians. So in part, there is a uh, spiritual component. Uh, there's certainly a physical and emotional component. So we've been very fortunate in that way, in that we've had uh, resources from many, many groups, uh, you know, given to us uh, to help us with uh, just a, a, some situations that have been uh, unprecedented. I, I've been and uh, this is the most difficult, probably the most difficult time uh, that, uh, you know, that I, I, have, I have known. Uh, so uh, even for someone like our family, uh, this, is, this has been unprecedented and uh, some outside Christian resources have been helpful. So if any of you folks who have uh, helped Christchurch are listening, we want to uh, thank you once again for uh, your generosity and the way that you've contributed to the health of our community. Life must go on. Um, in reality, Israel must continue its day-to-day -day efforts, even in uh, the threat of time of war. And I know so many people there who are employed in the tourist industry or work. Mm -hmm. um, how is that going on? Is there still some tourism in any way, shape, or form? Zero. Okay. I, I don't know. Am I not supposed to do that anymore? Is that some kind of bad? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. You know, in this, okay. I mean, we, we're, we're hyper political right now here in America. Uh, unlike any time in history and so yeah you you did a big faux pas so but you're not here in america you're over there uh stuck in the middle I don't east know. yeah uh, i i'm I, I've, uh, i'm a man without a country so uh, i can say uh and i have no ties to any right-wing groups i'm look um life has to go on but the the economy uh is probably about to, is, is is soon going to take a nosedive and uh, we have this incredible uh, war budget. Uh, we have a finance minister that most people in this country have no confidence in. I want someone who has no experience. Um, so I think things will probably be worse than they actually have to be. There is no, uh, certainly no tourism. And um, Yes, a lot of people who are involved in the tourist industry are um, unemployed, have been unemployed, will be unemployed for a long time. As you know, the, as you well know, the international uh, high-tech sector, yes, is uh, struggling. Uh, it just happened on the stock market, you know, for the last few days. So Israel's high-tech is under uh, pressure. And finally, there's a growing boycott of Israel. Uh, different countries and companies around the world uh, do not want to uh, necessarily be involved with uh, uh, with other Israeli commercial concerns. And while this hasn't significantly harmed the economy, I think there are those economists who expect that in the coming years, this will, uh, this will become uh, quite a concern, right, for uh, for Israeli companies. So yeah, all of these factors together uh, mean that uh, life uh, is economically uh, difficult for people, and it's uh, it's going to it's certainly going to get worse with higher unemployment, higher inflation, 
uh, higher gas prices, for example. I don't know what you pay for gas in the U.S., but we pay eight dollars a gallon. Um, uh, so, uh, it people complain. When people complain in America. I, I don't have much sympathy for them. Um, we have the highest, uh, higher, well, some of the highest, or one of the highest cost of living countries in the world, uh, and people make about a third of what you make in the U.S. So. Um, there is a uh, an attempt here to have guns and butter at the same time, and uh, it take, takes a very, very heavy it places a heavy burden not only on the economy but on on individual working fam families. So, all right. So I mentioned before World War Three. Do you feel that you're in the state of war of World War Three? Is this going to be an international uh, beyond the um, Middle East or? No, I don't. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I, want, I don't want to be a prophet. Uh, I, world War Three will happen probably like World War Two did and World War One, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody quite planned it. Nope. It just happened because of uh, it was stupid uh, things. Know, right, some hiccup. Right, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, certainly nobody wants World War Three. even Iran doesn't want a big war with Israel. Um, but who knows? Who knows? P uh, uh, we, uh, I, I was predicting, you know, uh, up until recently that there would even be, there wouldn't be a clash with, uh, with Hezbollah or even Iran. But then again, then Hezbollah makes a mistake and they kill 12 children drew's children on a soccer field uh so they cross a bridge too far israel has to respond and of course nobody planned this uh but this is what happens this is what happens in international affairs uh and it's incumbent upon uh our leaders and policy makers right to to be as judicious and careful uh as careful as possible uh, I don't f feel like this is going to happen, but then again, you know, it, it's you, it, it's hard to predict, and and we we should we should be cautious. We should be prayerful. We should be cautious. Uh, the last thing the world needs now is a regional conflict, or even an, uh, certainly an, an international conflict. Uh, you know, even on, even on the most basic uh, fundamental levels. I don't know if you realize this, but there is a huge shortage of ammunition in the world. The United States uh, can barely uh, fight a war with China or even fight a war with Iran uh, because we'd soon run out of ammunition. Israel probably doesn't have enough ammunition for a long war with Hezbollah. Ukraine doesn't have enough ammunition, right? Uh, the Russians are probably short of ammunition. Maybe at the end of the day, that's kind of a good thing. Uh, but there, there are practical uh, issues like this that um, probably most people, uh, most of the public doesn't, uh, you know, certainly doesn't even even consider. So we're prayerful. I hope others will join us in prayer. Uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And when I say pray for the peace of Jerusalem, I don't mean to uh, uh, ignore Damascus or Beirut or. Cairo or Amman, uh, I, I do think the Bible uh, teaches that uh, there is a, uh, a connection, right, between uh, Israel and the nations, especially Israel and the church. I think there's a mutuality or an independence, and I think by praying for Israel and the Jewish people, uh, yes, uh, their welfare and more, that actually we are actually praying uh, for the church and even praying for uh, uh, praying for their for their neighbors um, so I think being for Israel or being empathetic with Israel uh, certainly never means that we don't um, care for Palestinians or care for the for you know the, the, the region as a whole but we should be morally clear Kevin right groups like Hamas which is an Islamic death cult or you know the 
uh, shenanigans of uh, Iran, Hezbollah, I, I don't think we can and should uh, compromise uh, compromise with them. You know, this is uh, evil, and uh, it it needs to to be clearly confronted. Whether it's you know pro Hamas demonstrators in the United States, or whether it's Iranian activity in in Kurdistan or or other countries of the world, so that is a great way to sign off this episode um, uh, in prayer. Yeah, to okay. to seek it and to do it, and that's what we, we asked of our audience: if hey, what can I do? Well, probably nothing except prayer, and that's the most important thing you can do is to pray for yeah. peace and uh, to to seek God in all this because at the end of the day we want to glorify God uh, in our witness and we don't do that by cowering we do that by uh, uh, kneeling and I, I'd ask my audience to do that David I want to thank you so much for your time and I hope that thank we can check, check you, up with Kevin, you uh, for and, having and a, you know, in a month or a couple weeks as, as news uh, continues from your area and we do keep your, your family your, yourself and your church and our prayers uh, in unprecedented times in in, in this this recent uh, uh, evil. 